Thank you very much. We have a lot to do tonight. As every night, the world is changing so fast, it's creating lecture topics for me faster than I can lecture. The world is changing in our favor, and we don't seem to know it. We're losing some ground and don't know why we are losing it. We're gaining ground and don't know how to consolidate it. And principally because we have gone away from the subject for tonight. We have lost the art and the drive to be an African people. And you cannot be another people and rescue yourself while imitating another people. You have to understand what happened to you as you entered what Professor Van Sertima refers to as the 500-year room. The European, as I have said before, not only began to colonize the world, he began to colonize information about the world, and he began to control images. But the most successful thing he did from his point of view, and the most tragic thing he did from his point of view, he colonized the image of God. And he started you on a tragic journey where so many of us worship everything white from a white god to white bread. For many of us get a picture fixed in our mind where we worship white Jesus over the weekend and plead to a white boss for economic survival the rest of the week and wonder why we lack respect for our black father, our black lover, our black uncle. If he changed the images around to show himself in power and got people imitating him, then you cannot be your African self because you've been transformed into someone else's culture container and you are reacting to being away from the culture that produced you in the first place. And you don't look back enough in Africa to understand that there were no rape cases in Africa. No teenage pregnancy in Africa. No prostitution in Africa. And no Africans worship a God that the Africans did not sanction. The spirit of a people is reflected in their approach to salvation to a deity of their choosing. I am not talking about changing God. I'm talking about changing God concepts, changing approaches. If you go to Japan and look at Buddha, he's Japanese. Indonesia, he's Indonesian. China, he's Chinese. They're all Buddhists. But Buddha looks like the local people in each case. All right, now, let me seem to be talking away from the subject for a few minutes. Let's look at the case in China. Let's look at the case of the Chinese attack on African students calling them black devils. Then let's look at the case of the Chinese students 
confronting their own government and demanding democracy without understanding they got more democracy than the people they're imitating. Creating statutes of liberty, imitations of the statute of liberty, and quoting Abraham Lincoln, who was a racist, assuming that there's some democracy here without understanding how the nation was fashioned in this country for free white Protestant males, middle class and up, those who agreed with the prevailing political status quo and who owned property. When they said liberty and justice for all, that was the all, they didn't even mean white women. So if someone going to turn to America as their inspiration for democracy, they're turning to a bad example. On our way over, uh, we, Reverend Brown and I were discussing just democracy, and he, he picked out the case of the Chinese troops. The Chinese troops hadn't shot anybody. And, and some of them, you know, refused to hurt these kids. That's their cousins and their uncles and, and their nephews. They got some humanity. Over here, they knock the living hell out of you. <laughs> a state trooper would take the butt of his gun and make you wish you'd never been born. <laughs> and he don't care about you being his cousin. He said, get the hell out of this pocket. You go get out of there. He put a, ba a bayonet in your behind. <laughs> they got more democracy in China than they will ever have over here. Now, are these people crazy? Have they read their own literature? Confucius had more to say about democracy and humanity and manhood and womanhood than Thomas Jefferson. Let them go back to their own, own writers. And when a people lose themselves and become so enthusiastic about things that belong to other people, they become the captives of those other people. And the Chinese are forgetting something. Not too many years ago, there was a foreign settlement in China, in Shanghai. The Chinese couldn't even touch a foreigner. Couldn't, the, the foreigners had their own police force, their own courts. There were hotels in Shanghai where well, the only Chinese woman who could go into the hotel, the cleaning woman and a whore. And there were signs on the hotel saying Chinese and dogs not allowed. What in hell do they think they're talking about? They want American style democracy. I don't want American style democracy. I, I will trade for theirs with all its drawbacks. I would take any kind of democracy if it's on it. And this is the trap we're getting ourselves into. We think we can buy a piece of somebody else's pie. We don't know the cook who baked the pie. And we don't know the pie may be poisoned. Bake your own pie. Design your own government. Look at Africa. There's not a single African government in all Africa. And this is why the African Revolution went wrong. Not a single African government dared to come into being using African methodology, using an African system of government. Going back into African history, and see the African democratic form. Now let's go back and pick up an example. During the reign in ancient Ghana of a king called Ten Kambenin, the lowest person in the kingdom could petition his king. He would petition through the council 
and the council was duty bound to take his complaint to the king. And if enough people of his status complain about the king, the council had to recommend the abdication of the king. And the king couldn't do about it. Couldn't do nothing about it. This is a monarchy, and yet it was democratic. And this is why Ten Comedian was known as the king who rode out twice a day, every day. He would ride out among his people and administer justice. And anybody who wanted to talk to the king could approach the king. And did not have to move from his presence until he was, he, he was sure that justice had been done in his case. And he would ride out again in the evening in splendid regalia, dogs with gold collars, horses dressed better than the then kings of Europe, men of the mat, men with silk and brocade mats, just in case the horse want to take a nap to lay down the mat so the horse can rest a while. Splendor at its best, controlling the gold country, fabulously rich, and the people shared in the riches. The assumption is that a monarchy cannot also be democratic. When we go back and look at these African farms, we don't need to turn to the West for democratic farms. We had these farms. And we had communal living before someone invented communism. We had social living before someone invented socialism. But when it's coming from Europe because of our European fascination, we think it has to be good because it came from them. We have not looked deeply at what was taken from us because we have not looked at the great river civilizations of Africa. Now this is a great concern for a lot of people, but because of our number in the world and how we are dispersed in the world, we supposed to be winning. Some of the great wealth in the world is in our hands. 98% of the gold the gem diamonds comes out of Africa. The bulk of the gold comes out of Africa. Most of the cobalt comes out of Africa. Manganese out of Africa. Two thirds of the copper in the world comes out of Africa. Great deal of the zinc and the lead in the world comes out of Africa. If we united African people all over the world, we could close down American industry. And if we develop a good agriculture as we had before, our people could be fed indefinitely and we could eat indefinitely and we could go to school indefinitely and say that if you don't want to pay my price for my goods, then I'll keep it. And they tell you, eat it. Is it we, we don't have to eat it. We got corn. We got pigs. We got everything. We got cattle. We got sheep. We got goats. Our people going to eat whether we sell it or not. We're like a person in a card game who's got all the high cards and failed to put, it, put the cards down. All right. Someone has sent me a book that they've been working on a number of years. I didn't think he'd quite bring it off. It's called Why We Lose. Jake Beeson of Minnesota. Indiana. He has addressed himself to the question, but inasmuch as so many of us in the world, so strategically located, why are we losing? And why are smaller people winning? And why are we losing in the face of that? And we need to ask some critical questions. With all the things in our hands, with all the resources, we can, that can be made available to us while we're losing. 
I think we're looking at ourselves in the wrong way. And we're asking the wrong things from each other. Farrakhan wants a separate state in Africa. I said, please, no. We don't need another Liberia. <laughs> a sick nation where black Americans and Caribbeans went to say that they're going to civilize that heathen brother. We don't need no condescending attitude toward Africans abroad and Africans in Africa. If we return to Africa, we will return and walk the same street with the Africans, <laughs> go to the same school, fight the same battles, and cry over the same defeat. No separation between African people and African people any place in the world. It's not needed. And if you think you're going to have a separate state in the United States, you're dreaming because no white people are going to move aside and give you no state. You, you can have a multiplicity of miniature states. Your community, you can make your community into a miniature state. And there are places in the rural south where most of the county is black. You can gain control of that county, gain control of these small cities. Now there are places where we can have a high degree of sovereignty, where we can practice for the kind of skills that we will take out to Africa. But the whole separate state concept is impractical. We have to stop dissipating so much energy on impractical projects tear ourselves down to what is realizable. Now, before going back to the question, can we be an African people again, let's define what an African people are, what they are, and let's define what happened to the Africanness of African people. And let's look at to what extent are we still an African people and don't seem to know it. Living in rural Alabama, in Georgia, and traveling in Africa, I've seen identical traits. I've seen cultural manifestations no different from one place than the other. And if you tell the black American he's doing something African, he won't hit you. And yet, through genetic transference, he still maintains so much that is Africa. What sustained Africa those many years before the foreigner? What did he create within himself that he had a society where he not only had no jail, but no word in his vocabulary that meant jail? He created a system where man's function was to bring people in harmony with nature. There are some aspects of it that may work for them. But our concept of consensus in talking that the African, the European called Palava, uh, African Parliament, Perceive. We need to look at that again. What can we draw from that? We need to look at our families again. And I need to look at my own family and when there was debates and my great grandmother was alive and finally she would listen to the debates and then she would render an opinion based on it. If there was any dispute, all she had to do was to stand up and tap her cane on the floor, which means the court is over, the decision is in, no further conversation. She had said the wisest thing, she would given it all kind of thought, she said that listen patient to everybody's argument, analyze the argument and reach the decision 
and that was our Supreme Court. And she was nearly always right. She was one of the great loves of my life because if anybody wanted to punish me, she would say, send the boy to me. And I start laughing inside. 108 years old, how hard can she hit? <laughs> Felt more like hugging to me. <laughs> the whipping was of short duration, but the lecture would last the rest of the evening. <laughs> she would tell me the story. I think we have grown too much away from each other and we have not listened uh, to each other. We have not consulted farm that we created. I don't know who Robert is, who did it, Robert's Rules of Order. And if, if he's alive, and I hope I got enough sense to choke him when I find him. <laughs> he spoiled more meetings. Point of order, Mr. Chandler. Point of information, Mr. Chandler. I want to hold it up <laughs> where you can listen to consensus. The whole meeting will be over in a little while. Because the, the, the best thinkers among you will arrive at a consensus based on what's on the floor. And you'd have the best opinion you're going to get. All right, now, how did we lose being an African people in as much as in spite of foreigners, we continue to be an African people all over the world until about the end of the 19th century. Outside of Africa, the most African place in the New World was the Caribbean islands and parts of Brazil. <coughs> How is it that 50 years later, they become black English, black French, black Spaniard, black Dutch? and forgot about it. When they had brought out some of the most successful slave revolts in history based on the cohesiveness of their Africanness. How do we get it back? We can get it back by looking at what kind of success we had when we communicated one to the other. We should examine very critically what other people are saying about us. We should examine very critical the people who say that they are our friends when they are the people trying to take a community away from us. There are too many things happening in this city that we have not examined. We should examine the concept of planned shrinkage a plan to drive the poor out of New York and make it the bedroom for the middle class. They don't want poor whites in the, in the city either. Poor whites won't even be able to pay the rent. Now, if a man makes sandwiches in a luncheon air, and he's good at it, why shouldn't he have a decent home? Why must he be some kind of an executive to get a decent place to stay? Now, in an African setting where the king was in charge of the distribution of goods and services, he would get a place commensurate with his need, irrespective of his ability to pay. This was a form of socialism. And they did not call it socialism. They didn't call it anything. They just lived it out. And what did the Europeans do? Formulize it and dogmatize it and came back to sell you what you had in a much better form before you know they exist. And that's what is still happening. That's what's happening in our courts. That's what's happening in relationship to the disintegration of our community. 
That's what's happening with the control of image. That's what's happening with the bad movies being made. That's what's happening with uh, Spike Lee's misconception of the black college and the black uh, college president. It's happening because we are not controlling the image and we are not controlling the curricula. In New Orleans, speaking with two college presidents on the subject of the future of the predominantly black colleges, I said, I cannot speak on the future of the predominantly co black colleges because I don't know one predominantly black college. Right. Because I don't know one, I will address myself to what would a black college look like if it did come into being, if it dared to be black. What kind of curricula would it have? It would have what the students at Howard University were demanding, an Afrocentric curricula. It's a contradiction in terms for students at Howard to demand an Afrocentric curricula at a black school, because at a black school, that's the only kind of curricula you should have. Right. At Brandeis and Yeshiva, you've got a Jewish-oriented curricula. They don't apologize for having it. They said, this is what it is. Now, they didn't say, don't come here. But they said, if you come here, this is the curricula. We're not going to change it to suit you. Black schools should be good enough to train any student of any race and any religion in the country and still have a curricula that predominantly favors black people all over the world. If you go to Harvard, Harvard was found as a Protestant school to train the future rulers of the United States. It's not going to change its curricula for anyone. It's going to remain. One of the Blyden brothers went to Harvard and is going to get a degree in political science. And they seem to remind him every day that Ralph Bunch was the last person who got a degree in political science and that certain things are expected of you if you get a degree in political science at Harvard. And so they set him down on his committee and he thought that because three of the members of the committee was his personal friends that he had it made. So they asked him, who is your political hero? He said, Parnell, it's a man don't talk nonsense. Parnell, an Irish patriarch who blew a revolution chasing after some English, English woman. That we will not give you a PhD at Harvard if your hero failed in his mission. He must succeed in his mission even he had to step over his mother, he had to politically succeed in his mission. And so he thought about it and took some time off. He came back, wrote the PhD thesis in 45 days, and asked, who's your hero? He said, Cromwell, this is good. <laughs> Cromwell chopped off a few heads, here and there, <laughs> kill the king, but he succeeded. He held England together <laughs> and to spill a little blood here and there, but he didn't fail. He wanted business in England, so the Jews had been expelled from England. He brought them back. Now, this was a lesson. 
is that Harvard is set up to train people whose focal point and whose hero worshiping must be focused on people who succeeded no matter how and not dreamers who dreamed the dream and got stalled and blew the deal chasing after a lady. And what I'm saying is that if you the Hamilton Institute, any institute, a black curriculum must have good courses in African history, not just a subject that allude to it. It must have good courses in African womanhood. It must show now that one of the main reasons why the status of women was so much different in Africa is that the African recognized early in life something which Western men still are not ready to recognize. The duality of relationship and how he would have to put both of them together to create a single relationship. And then while the king is referred to in the masculine agenda, the king, in order to be total, had to have both the masculine and the female gender. And that you could not be a god without having a goddess. You only half of a god until you get a goddess. Now when you look back at how all of it started, when you go back 10,000 years, when you look at the status of the European and all that ice, seasons are short, he's got a short time to harvest the crop. Four months, he's got to plant, harvest, and store. The wife must work, every hand must work. If he tells, if he gets angry with his wife and tells her to get out, she has to cop a plea to stay in because where is she going to go in all that ice? And she go to another household, that's another mouth to feed. So she's not welcome there. So she was beholden to him from the beginning. And this is part of her psyche of being beholden to him. She was never free, and she's not free now. Only now she's a slave on an air-conditioned oxygen block. Okay, you look at Africa, where the women started agriculture. <coughs> the women got tired of the man going on to hunt. <coughs> she began to plant gardens. She began to have a food supply so close to the house. And when she said, where are you going? I'm going on hunt. No, we got enough food on. Stay on. The forest was a drugstore. If you get ill, she can go into the forest and <coughs> find some plant that will cure him. She prepared the food. She took care of the children. And when you married her, you didn't marry an individual. You married a dynasty. When you wanted to marry her, you didn't consult her. You consulted the head of her family, who call a council of the uncle, then the females call a council, then the other side met, and both sides agree, then you can make the approach. She's part of a totality. If your cattle raiser, each side gives Ten herd of cattle. The uncles give ten. So now, before they are married, they got thirty cows. Look at the mechanism put together. A lot of people feel ill at ease when I say that the romantic marriage is a Western ad invention. The I love you marriage. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
It lasts through the season. Sometimes it lasts through the summer. It may be gone by the winter. I'm talking about I respect you, Mary. When you, you're putting together two families, sometimes two villages are coming together. Now suppose he get a knock on the head and get a little foolish and tell her to get out. She'd look at him like a fool and say, who's going to prepare your food? Who's going to take care of your children? Who's going to go to the forest and get something to cure you when you're sick? And besides, if she had to go out, there's plenty of places to go. She ain't got to go in no snow. <laughs> you see the independence from the beginning? And the independence did not mean dominance. It did not mean what, what, what white women live think it means. It did not mean what you are foolish enough to think it means. It did not mean that you got to declare war on him. The, metric, the, the line came down through her side of the family, matrilineal. The foreigners introduced patrilineal. Nearly all African societies are matrilineal. That means in most cases the king's son can never be king, but the king's sister's son can be king. Eliminating competition. There are exceptions, the Zulus are exceptions. They're, they're patrilineal. And yet in a patrilineal society like the Zulus, when Chaka, after the death of his mother, Nainda, when he uh, decreed that there'd be no crop planted for a year, people accepted that. There was enough meat and wild vegetables, they can survive a year without planting a thing, no big deal. 15,000 men to guard the mother's grave for a year, no problem, so they go and guard the grave. Then he said, no, he maimed the cow so that they could mourn for the passing of his mother. Nobody complained. Then he said, no cohabitation for a year. The old ladies came together and said that our king is crazy. <laughs> he has outlawed life itself. We cannot continue as a people if he's going to stop this activity. The, this item would not be so important except that I'm showing you that in a patrilineal society, where that is male oriented, the female council had enough power to order the death of the ceremonial death of the king. Before he goes up to the moon, he's going to communicate with the gods and the spirits to give him the sign. If he don't get the sign, he ain't gone. Is it all right with his God? Is it all right with his? spiritual, with his spirituality. This can get confusing because a whole lot of people think the Africans created a religion. Don't ever charge this crime to the Africans. I'm using my words advisedly. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have been turned into murder cults because once they emerge, they began to be used to justify the murder of other people. Christianity said if he's an infidel, he has no soul, and it's all right to murder him, it's all right to enslave him. Judaism said if he's not of our faith, it's all right. Islam said if he's not of our faith, we can put him to the sword. The Africans created an overall spirituality and a God of love. These foreigners who misunderstood African spirituality created gods of vengeance. 
and created what I call a carbon copy of African spirituality. I am not less religious, I am more, because I say examine the carbon copies and entertain the idea of going back to the original. I didn't say change God. I didn't say change churches. I said change concepts. Change approaches. Stay where you are, but look at it in a different way. Because the Africans created an overall spirituality for all life was under God, was the manifestation of God. And he did not have a weekend religion. He had a religion that was operational on his life every single day of the week. He did not have to build a temple with a whole massive space for praying because he could pray anywhere. Akhenaten, who is accused of giving the world monotheism, and that's not true, and the Jews who said they gave the world monotheism, and that's not true. Monotheism, the concept of the oneness of God, was here all along. Akhenaten never said he gave the world monotheism. All Akhenaten did was to deal with the corrupt priesthood of his day that was restricting the movement of people based on the fact that if you go in a certain area, you're not under the protection of God because I, I'm the one that controls the message to God. All Akhenaten said that God was omnipresent. God was omnipotent. God was everywhere. God was in the wind. If you want to pray, pray to the wind. God was in the tree. God was in a local, lowly cockroach. But most important, God was in you. You look inside of yourself. Now, if you look at what the Africans gave the world, and if you read W.E.B. Du Bois and James Baldwin, you will find essays on the duality of American blacks. Two souls in one body, two personalities. What the African gave the world is a form of duality. Now when we look at duality, the African use conflict to solve conflict. He used conflict to horn one conflict against the other and to arrive at a synthesis between the two conflicts. So therefore conflict did good because conflict presented him with the opportunity of arriving at a synthesis in between the two conflicts. Now if you understand what I'm saying, you will understand that neither Du Bois or, or Booker T. Washington was wrong. And yet, the difference of opinion between Du Bois and Booker T. Washington gave us the opportunity to analyze both of them and arrive at a conclusion that will not be positively Booker or positively Du Bois. And that is called synthesis. A way of solving a problem by looking at both sides of the problem and extracting from both sides what you need to form a single solution. We have stopped doing this because we were forced into a society that was individual as against society that produced us that was plural. When you come out of a plural society, you are tolerant of different opinions. There were many ways of worshiping in Africa, but the Africa knew one thing, well, there were different ways 
of worshiping that there was one spiritual force for the universe. Different ways of approaching the spiritual force, but the spiritual force remained the same while the concept and the approach varied from one culture to the other. Now, Western man thinks this is a conflict, and it is not a conflict. If we were ever African people again, we would understand that, and we would understand that you cannot lift an African people with the slave master's concept of a religion that was created out of your spirituality in the first place. Because he has a one-dimensional approach and you had a pluralistic approach to the same religion. Many ways of approaching it without changing the central message of the religion itself. What you've got to look at is something that frightens a lot of people and something some black people might want to kill you for doing. You've got to look at the Hebrew entry. When you look at the Hebrew entry and the mythology about that entry, you begin to understand something. They came from an individualistic society in Western Asia. They began to copy and individualize African folklore and to project it through their own understanding of culture as against the African understanding. And not knowing African rule of morality, they began to violate these rules and the African with his customary kindness towards strangers did not punish them for violating the rules, because at this time, they began to violate women without any punishment and without any marriage. They began to produce, now this is the historical origin of black teenage pregnancy, the farm. When I delivered a talk on it and didn't take the brothers to task, the ladies who invited me got a little angry. Now the brothers got a proper share of blame, but I wasn't discussing the present, I was discussing the historical origin. The foreign entry who did not understand the culture of Africa and had the African expel the foreigner for violating his rules it would have been better, but the African looked with some kind of toleration because the foreigner did not understand the rules, not knowing that the foreigner's children would start conflict between African and African that would last for 3,000 years and is not settled to this day. Once we understand how the mulatto problem almost destroyed the Haitian Revolution and why the same problem turned Jamaica into a sick political child, you don't understand what I'm talking about. But there's certain things we sweep under the rug, but there's no more room under the rug now. <laughs> Now we're going to have to turn back to rug and deal with it. Because we have to deal with a loyalty system. We cannot build a nation with any large number of people within the nation who have a question 
as to whether they are loyal to us or their father. Everybody in the house must be loyal to the house or get out of the house. Because this is a time of great emergency when our very existence is at stake. Now when you look at the Hebrew entry, 70 in numbers, and we're to believe that record that's recorded in the Bible, entry 70 in numbers led by their patron, Abraham, leaves 600,000 in number. And leave because the Africans, with their customary kindness, understand that they were collaborators with the first invaders of Africa, called the Shepherd King. Instead of putting on, the, putting upon them and punishing them, the Africans said, "If you are now ready to obey African law, now that the Africans are back in power, you may stay." Otherwise, you have to go. The 600,000 were the ones who, who decided to go. But they had come, in, they come into Africa with no clear language, no clear religion, and no clear culture. And when they left, they had all three. Africa had made them a people. And they were never grateful to it. They never returned the favor. They never sent a thank you note. They copied the African folklore, and they copied the meaning of the Bible from African books, <coughs> books that the Africans had created before. There is a book recently published called The Awakening Osiris. And this book deals with a simplified approach to African books written before the Bible. The most interesting, the one, only two I'll call to your attention. One is the book of Hunafa, that means the Paraphrase of Hunafa, written by somebody named Hunafa. <coughs> when the Egyptians say, we came from the headwaters of the Nile, near the mountain of the moon where the great god Happy dwells at Kilimanjaro. It's significant because the ancient Egyptians identified their origin in spite of all the nonsense trying to make them white. They said in their literature where they came from. There's a whole library of books to prove it. This is why the, the book called the purpose of the book of Hunafa is important and part of the book of the dead and uh, sometimes published separately. But there's another book we need to look at. That's the book of Kananu because there was a man Kananu. I remember Asa Hilliard calling this to our attention. And there was another man who thought they could get some money from him and so Connor knew was on his way to sell his product farm product so this man put his clothing down across the road if Connor knew went around the clothes you have to go through the man's cornfield so he could sue him for going to his cornfield and if he went over the clothes he was suing for messing up his clothes so Connor knew went before the court and started defending himself. He defended himself so well, saying what the king's supposed to do, what the council's supposed to do, his rights as a human being, how he was wrong. And finally they told the king, and the king said, keep him talking and write it down. Because he was laying down a law for the country <laughs> by saying what the country should be doing, he was laying down a law better than the country had. And so they took uh, his ranting and made it into law. 
This is the significance of a common man on his way to market and someone trying to find a way to do him in and he goes before the court and pleads his case. And his plea becomes part of the law of that day. These are the books that came long before the Bible. I am not saying you need not read the Bible. I'm saying except for these books, there would have been no Bible. I did not say choose one over the other. I said that both of them need attention. Yes. Thank you. Both of them need attention. And you need to pay attention to African problems of problem solving before something called European civil law entered that did not understand African methodology of problem solving. All right. The problem in Africa today in every single country is that you do not have in administration in Africa a single African country. Not one. You do not have a single African country that fashioned its government after a theory developed by Africans. You have an educated African running the country trying to develop parliamentary government that they took from the people who educated them without understanding that that same government is not working so well for the people who taught it to them. Democratic government is not working so well for the people who said they believed in democracy. And what you needed to do right now is to restore the African system of consultation where we arrive at a consensus. We can arrive at a consensus without a vote. Because once the main speakers have spoken, the council analyzed the best thought that has come forward, then arrive at a consensus based on what he what they have heard. This is what we call a a synthesis. He can't do everything that was asked of him, but they try to do the best that was asked of them using the most reasonable things that were being asked of them. And then the last blow when he said, what have I done to you, sons of my fathers? And that was the last of the greatest warrior, one of the great natural warriors in human history. He was not murdered. You must make a distinction between murder and ceremonial death. This is a ceremonial death because the women assumed that he had violated the basic survival custom of the Zulu people. After him, the re-emergence of Africaness one of his assassins became king, Ding Gong. And after Ding Gong, I'm tracing the, the real fight that started in South, in South Africa. Now the British pushed the Zulus and the Zulus pushed back. The British pushed the Boers and the Boers pushed the Zulus and the Zulus pushed back. And this started the physical struggle for Southern Africa. There had been wars before, 11 with the people called Hottentot and Bushmen. This is so well recorded in Fell's work and, and by the Zulu writer um, Thomas Mafalo and by the present day living Zulu writer Mazola Kamini in his work in Pachaka, the Zulu. And with some respect in Omar Cooper's work, the Zulu aftermath. And with some respect and but some misunderstanding the book by Morrison, Morris, 
in America called the washing of the spears. The Zulu wars, the most recorded the, and the best recorded wars in, um, in Africa. And the main thing that I'm trying to get at is that these Africans had not lost their Africanness. They were fighting in an African way. They were living in an African way. They had physical training in an African way. They were not this time imitating Europeans and falling into traps. It was not until early in the night, early in the 19th century, early in the 20th century, that African missionary trained Africans began to wear European clothes, develop European taste, and become Europeans in black faith. What we need to look at, we need to look at the end of the 19th century, all over Africa, when African people were losing their Africanness. We need to look at it all over the world, with first Africa, in East Africa, the fight for Africa's soul between the Catholics, the Protestants, and the Arabs, fighting over the soul of Uganda. The White Fathers, those the Catholics, had armed their converts. The Arabs had armed their converts, but the British had armed their converts better than the rest, so the British got the upper hand. And once the British got the upper hand, they won. But the British did not take away from Uganda the fact that Uganda had moved too far away from their Africanness. Uganda today is the most Catholic country in all Africa. And yet they maintain the four kingdoms that either man misunderstood had he understood them and ruled through them, he'd still be ruling Uganda. But the loss of the Africanness along the coast of East Africa, it had started with the coming of the Arabs who had no respect for the matrilineal system. And if you travel in Africa, in West Africa, and East Africa, notice that in East Africa, the men are mostly in charge of the marketplace. Notice in West Africa, the women are mostly in charge of the, Africa, the marketplace. Because the Arabs destroyed the concept of matrilineal, they installed the patrilineal, a form of male supremacy. While in West Africa, West Africa that was Islamized, was Islamized by Islamized blacks who knew what part of the culture to leave alone. So they left alone the matrilineal system, though they were converted to Islam. Certain prerogatives they had before, they could maintain, and they could react to it. Now, the market women in West Africa have a court, have an entire society based on market women, the Sunday society. These are very powerful women. And many of them control large sums of money, and a few of them are millionaires. And every man, you go to Senegal, you see different men in the marketplace, nearly every man rents his concession from a woman. No man is out ranting, to, these women are ruling everything, they got all the money. Because he understands that the marketplace was a reserve for women. East Africa don't understand this because the Arab traders, being male chauvinists, would not trade with women. It's a pity that the brothers who belong to the religion don't understand the religion and cannot accept, cannot separate Islam from Arabism. Once you separate Islam from Arabism, and once you deal with the statistics that there are probably 127 million Arabs in the world, 
Most of them live in Africa. There are more African Muslims than there are Arabs in the world. What am I saying? I'm saying that if you want to belong to the religion, in as much as you are the majority in numbers into the religion, why don't you seize it and be the caretakers of it and give it a direction over and above that of corrupt Arabism? I didn't say leave it. I said control it. I'm saying give it a concept that is distinctly yours. Muhammad Abadu, Amadou Bambara in Senegal created a sect of Muslims that was anti-Arab. They don't even go to Mecca. So I would not go pray to an Arab dog. They have a mosque right there in Senegal at, at Tuba. I'm not asking you to do this. I'm saying that Certain Africans <coughs> have imposed distinct Africanness on this religion to a point where they have made it African. I'm not saying change religion. I'm saying Africanize everything that's a part of your life and everything religious, pol politics, social, fraternities, Everything must become an instrument of your liberation or you must throw it into the ash can of history as wasting your time. Yeah. All people convert organizations into instruments of their liberation. While we out Pope the Pope and out Muhammad, Muhammad, we are Puritans, and we follow it as laid down by someone else without reading into it a concept that is distinctly ours and approaching it in a manner that is distinctly ours. As we look toward the 21st century, we don't have much time to waste. We don't have much time to get ready. If we're going to be an African people, we can't be dreaming all the time. If we, we need to stop talking about apartheid until we train some people to take over South Africa. I mean, don't tell me about apartheid. How many diamond cutters have you trained? How many mining engineers do you have? So you take over South Africa right now, all you have to do is turn it back over to white folks to rule. They mastered the mechanics of getting the stuff out of the ground. And you could have done that. How many students do we have at the Colorado School of Mines? We built airports for people in the United States. You mean to tell them we can build an airport in Africa? The blacks in charge of the harbor in New Orleans and in Newport News. You mean to tell them we can't go to Africa and be in charge of the harbor? I'm saying that to be African again is that Africa in Africa and Africa outside of Africa must draw on the strength and the talent of African people all over the world. We must have a pan-African agenda that goes beyond what religion you belong to and what fraternity and sorority you belong to. You really don't need to belong to any of them because the Greeks had no fraternities and sororities before they came in touch with African secret societies. Oh uh -huh.